All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our March Water Ambassador webinar series. Um, as a reminder, the Water Ambassador program is a partnership program between Martin County and the University of Florida IFAS Extension Florida Sea Grant program. It's an education program designed to inform Florida residents, um, specifically in the Treasure Coast region, about stormwater and water quality issues affecting our area. Um, these are the, our upcoming presentations that we have through July. I'll be putting the registration link for all of these upcoming webinars in the chat box. So stay tuned and you'll also be receiving um, an email probably within the next couple of days with the registration links as well as the recording links for our previous webinars that we've had. Just as a reminder for the Zoom system, um, we do ask that you keep yourselves muted and turn your video off for the duration of the presentation. Feel free to turn the video back on during the question and answer session if you want. You can see the participants by clicking the participant um, icon on the bottom. On the top, you can click the view options. We suggest side-by-side -side mode for optimal um, viewing so you can see both the presenter as well as the presentation. And if you need to leave the meeting at any time, just click the bottom right hand button. We will be and are recording this and we'll be posting it on the Martin County Sea Grant website. Again, we know that this is a really long URL, so we'll be putting it in the chat and then you'll be receiving it in an email as well. Or you can just Google Martin County Sea Grant and you'll see all of the Water Ambassador um, webinars listed on the right hand side by date and topic. We will be um, saving all questions till the end, but please put your questions in the chat box so that we can keep a list of them. And then um, once Savannah's presentation is over, we'll go through all of the chat questions. And with that, I am super excited to um, introduce my colleague, Dr. Savannah Berry. Savannah grew up on a small farm in central Virginia and discovered her interest in marine ecology during a family vacation to small fishing towns along the Chesapeake Bay. After earning her BS in biology from the University of Virginia, Savannah split her time between Gainesville, Florida and Little Cayman Island, earning her master's in fisheries and aquatic sciences at UF. And after completing her master's, Savannah moved back to Gainesville full time to continue into a PhD program at UF, which she completed in 2016. Her graduate studies focused on seagrass ecology, but she also worked with coral reef systems and invasive lionfish. Savannah began serving the Nature Coast as a regional specialized agent with Florida Sea Grant and UF IFAS Extension in February 2016. She lives in Cedar Key, Florida, which if any of you haven't ever been, I highly recommend you go visit, <laughs> and is stationed full time at the Nature Coast Biological Station. So with that, I want to thank Savannah for being our presenter today, and I'm going to turn it over to her. All right, great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lisa. And I'm very happy to be here. And I'm not going to be talking about seagrass or lionfish or coral reefs today. So I'll go ahead and get my screen share up here and start my talk, which is going to focus on living shorelines and, um, and some of the work that we're doing to try to eliminate and reduce plastics from living shorelines practice. Uh, so before I start, I want to definitely acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Mark Clark, who's actually the original inventor of this reef prism material that I'm going to be talking to you about, and also a very close collaborator on a lot of the Living Shorelines work that I do. So we really rely a lot on our extension specialists at the university. Uh, so this, uh, basically everything I say could be equally credited to Mark Clark. Um, so if you have questions about the material and you email me, I may probably defer you to him. Okay, so just a quick outline really quick, just so that we're all on the same page about some of the terms I'm going to be using. I'll just go really briefly into what living shorelines are, and then I'm going to really sink my teeth into the, to the talk, rest of the talk about the reef prism material. Why do we need this material? Some benefits of them, and I'll give also some examples of projects where they've been used and talk a little bit about our pros which stands for Plastic Free Restoration of Oyster Shorelines Community and acknowledge some of our statewide partners of 
a few of which I saw joined the webinar today. And then I'll also talk about a local opportunity to get involved in this work for an upcoming workshop in the Fort Pierce area. Okay. So really quickly, when I use the term living shoreline, what am I talking about? So I'm talking about any type of shoreline erosion mitigation measure that relies on natural features such as mangroves, marsh grasses, and oyster reefs to address erosion and you know, storm activity along the coast. And that is in contrast to what we refer to generally as hardening or armoring of shorelines with seawalls and riprap, which is on the kind of gray or right-hand side of the spectrum. So there are certainly ways you can kind of use living shoreline elements and gray elements in the same project, and that's becoming increasingly common. Uh, but this concept of living shorelines is really kind of working with nature to address uh, forces that are confronting our shorelines. And we need living shorelines increasingly because the diagram on the left shows you how seawalls eventually fail. Even the best designed and best built seawall will eventually fail because of the process of wave energy reflection at the toe of that structure, which becomes the weak point. And without fairly expensive maintenance and replacement, all seawalls are guaranteed to fail eventually. And we've seen a really big increase globally in the percentage of shorelines that are hardened, even though many of these shorelines actually do not need to be hardened based on the wave energy climate there. Certainly this type of approach, the armoring approach is unavoidable in certain contexts, high wave energy, high commercial use areas, things like that. But in a lot of our back bays and sheltered shoreline areas and residential systems in Florida, they're actually quite suitable for a greener approach. Um, and that's that living shorelines. Okay, so now that we've covered that, I wanna talk a little bit, bit about why we decided to embark on this journey with reef prisms. And the two pictures I'm showing you right now are really common sites in living shorelines projects around the country. And this is the shell bag. So either bagging oyster shells in plastic mesh or deploying these shell bags out into the water. Um, it's fun and easy for volunteers to participate. The shell bags are pretty cheap to produce. Um, they are not too heavy, so people can lift them. They're very modular. You can stack them in many different ways, different layers, different shapes. And so because of the relative simplicity of this material and the relative um, you know, number of examples out there and the ease of entry into producing and using shell bags and living shorelines projects as the basis for the oyster reefs, uh, it, it just is a very widely applied practice. But most people that build living shorelines have kind of a love-hate relationship with the shell bag because like I said, they're pretty, they have a lot of benefits, but they also rely on plastic. And unfortunately, oysters have it kind of tough in Florida waters. And so a lot of places where these shell ba bags are deployed don't actually uh, end up accumulating oysters on them. And that makes the, shell, the bags vulnerable to degradation. They break, they may entangle things, and then they also release microplastics into the water, which um, is another rabbit hole you can go down if you all haven't covered this in this webinar series. Microplastics are just another form that pl plastics get into our environment and possibly into the food web. So it's pretty concerning to be part of, a, of an effort that's supposed to be environmentally beneficial and then end up having this kind of plastic cloud hanging over you. And so we wanted uh, to find a material that would retain many of the benefits of shell bags, but also not rely on plastic. And so this is where we came up with this idea of reef prisms. And like I said, Mark Clark was the originator of this idea. And he actually got the idea from watching YouTube videos of a guy that was building a house out of a similar material in the desert, but he was using burlap bags instead of the jute material that I'm gonna talk about. Um, but the base material that prisms are formed out of, and I'm not gonna use this term anymore throughout the talk, but for those of you who are interested in the chemistry of it, um, it's calcium sulfoaluminate is the type of cement that is used and it's used to coat 
a jute mat material that I'll show you some more pictures of. So it's basically a natural fiber that's coated with a cement and then formed into different shapes. The main shape that we've used in most of our project is this prism shape. But like I said, we wanted to retain a lot of those benefits of shell bags. So they are modular. You can stack them in many different configurations. Of course, they are plastic free. And there are different shapes like panels, reef ribs. We've even created what we've called reef turtles. And so there's a lot of different flexibility with the shapes and also configurations that this material can be used in. Um, CSA or that calcium sulfate aluminate is a greener cement than Portland cement. It has a lower carbon footprint. It has a more natural pH when it's fully set. Um, among some other things. So because of that, it's it's got the sort of base material itself has fewer environmental impacts even than a basic Portland cement formulation would be. And as I'll show you, these reef prisms and other shapes can also easily be built and also deployed by volunteers. Maybe not quite as easily as a shell bag, but given all the other benefits that we get in trade-off, uh, we think it's worth it to put in just a little bit of extra time to train the volunteers on the slightly more technical process of making a reef prism. Um, also, another really big thing that we see is the desire to use recycled shell. There are lots of really successful oyster shell recycling programs around the state, and part of the shell bagging events is a way to sort of link, close that loop between the shell that's collected from the restaurants and get it back out into the environment through this shell bagging. The reef prisms can be filled with shells so that um, integration with that shell recycling program can still be re retained. And then this picture here, I'll show you oysters love to recruit on the surface. And so it's um, the surface of a shell bag, the actual plastic material often is not what is getting recruited by oysters. It's really the shell material itself. So in the prism situation, the, both the oyster shells inside as well as the outer surface of the reef prism are available for oyster recruitment. They are biodegradable. So in the event of a project failing, like I mentioned, also can happen with shell bags where if for some reason we get a freshwater event or oysters just don't colonize very well on the surface and the reef ends up quote unquote failing <clears throat> to recruit oysters at least. Um, we then don't have this large hassle of having to go and, you know, pull out all of this degraded, you know, foot plastic and, and take that out of the water. And it's, it's definitely a big hassle when you have to remove a failed shell bag reef, whereas a reef prism reef, sort of the worst that would happen would be you would have some shells left over on the bottom. So they, they do have that benefit of being overall biodegradable in the event that they don't get coated with oysters. They are also fairly cheap to produce. Each unit four feet uh, long by one foot tall is about 14 to $15 with supply chain issues and inflation. We've seen that creep up a little bit, maybe closer to 17 with raw materials. If you factor in labor, which normally we're allowed to, we are able to get volunteer labor. Um, you know, of course you have to have to add in costs for that. Um, but again, given the benefits, they are relatively cheap, definitely not as cheap as shell bag, but again, ch ch cheapness and cost is not always the only factor to consider. And then they are also made from off the shelf materials. We've seen a lot of other plastic free alternatives that maybe have specialized molds or you have to order from a certain company that produces them. And so these can just sort of, as long as you find the right supplier for the jute and the CSA, any organization can adopt this practice, order the materials and produce them in-house. Um, so again, not exactly the same as shell bags, but we do think that they're close enough that these could be the new shell bags um, of the Living Shorelines community. Okay, so what is the process of forming a prism? I just wanted to show you some pictures. Um, basically, we start with the raw jute there. So you can see um, in this top left picture, uh, we have a fabric cutter that makes it really easy to cut these pre-defined lengths of jute. For the standard prism, we use 100 inches. And we basically cut that out and we have the three parts of our cement mix, which are sand, the CSA cement, and water. We pre-weigh those and then we mix them with a drill attachment when we're ready to uh, make the prism. 
Then you combine the pre-cut jute and the mixed cement in a tub and you sort of agitate that around to coat it. Then you lay it out flat, which is shown here. They're working with this 100 inch piece of jute to get it laid out flat on this table. And then they wrap it around a collapsible form, which the collapsible form is not available off the shelf. That is one thing that you'd have to construct yourself, but we provide support there. Um, but they wrap them around this collapsible form. And because this is a very fast setting cement, we can, after about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on temperature, pop that form out and then put that back through the assembly line. And this again is in contrast to Portland cement, which takes a lot longer set. And so it makes it a lot harder to do this assembly line process of forming the prism. Okay, so that's how you make a basic prism. And then after the first uh, setting round, then you add a cap to one end and you can either fill it with shell or not. So the empty prism by itself, the standard prism is about 45 pounds and um, it gives a lot of substrate on both the outer and inner surfaces for oysters to recruit. So you might sort of wonder, well, if once you fill it with shell, it's 120 pounds and that gives it a lot more resistance to wave energy coming in and makes it so they don't need to be staked down or anything like that. But this picture on the left is actually the inside of a prism that's been deployed for about a month. And you can see that there are a lot, there are a lot of oysters actually on the inner surface of this prism. And also we have accumulation of a lot of uh, sediment on the bottom surface of the prism, which gives it added weight. So you don't necessarily have to fill them with shell. Um, it's just an option. Certainly if you have a lot of shell material around, it gives you an extra, um, an extra benefit in that they're more stable as waves hit them. So this is a, a showing prisms on their end that have been filled with shell and are waiting to be capped with the final end cap, which can be done right in the field about 15 minutes to an hour before they actually get deployed into the water. Because again, this is a, a hydraulic cement, so it doesn't have to be dry. It can be exposed to water before it's fully cured and that won't harm the integrity of it. Okay, so some close ups of the highly complex surface of reef prisms that jute and concrete mix and then the double wrap around the form forms a lot of these really small interstitial spaces that are highly beneficial for oysters. Young oysters are really vulnerable to predation, especially by blue crabs and other things that uh, like to crush and capture the little oysters when they're small. And so when you have small interstitial spaces, uh, like the surface of the reef prism, the oysters do really, really well. And a lot of this is context dependent. Uh, one of these pictures is from Cedar Key, the one on the left, and the other one is from a reef in Goffinsville, which is off of uh, Nassau County and on the East Coast. And both of these areas have fairly high spat recruitment. So the oyster, the level of oyster recruitment you're going to see on any substrate you deploy is going to be related to the overall availability of oysters in the system. But in the places where we've seen prisms deployed with high oyster availability, they basically get 100% coated within a couple months and that protects the structure of the prism from that biodegradation that we talked about. Um, so oysters do very well um, as long as they're allowed a chance to, to access this substrate. Okay, so I talked about reef prisms being modular, sim similar to shell bags. So there's lots of different ways you can stack them. And I just wanna step through an example or two here where I show you, um, we have kind of ra different ranges of ways we like to use oysters in living shoreline projects. The first is called a sill, S-I-L-L, -L, which is on the left here. And this is basically just a, a using oysters as an outer toe or a protective edge for the most exposed waterward side of the salt marsh. And so I'll show you an example of that. Um, and then also another very common approach is to use oysters as slightly offshore reefs to break wave energy and then have a gap in between the immediate reef and the vegetated area behind, which is more like the situation on the right. And so all of these 
configurations, if you will, are related to your goals for the project? Is the goal really to establish a salt marsh? Are you trying to just enhance oyster population in general? Are you trying to address erosion? So uh, it's really important to define a goal for these projects. And I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures from a lot of different projects that had different goals. Um, but anyway, just, just let's start with the sill example. So uh, this is an example of a project from Cedar Key, the same project I just showed you on the last slide on the left, where we deployed reef prisms as to form a sill, that outer protective edge. And so in this case, we basically stacked the prisms in the shape of the sill. And then we came in and we added sediment behind because this shoreline had eroded so much that it was actually too low to establish vegetation. So we had to add sand into the area. Um, so these two uh, images, this is June, and then this was in August of 2020. And then these bottom two ones are in May and then August of 2021. Um, so we have uh, another layer of prisms added after this initial salt marsh establishment, and then we have more soil behind. Um, so that's an example of how reef prisms can be used as a sill and then additionally as a breakwater if, um, if another layer of prisms are added on top. So very flexible and adaptive to the local project needs. And then this is a more local example for you all. This is a, a, a most of these photos are from Katie Savoya Marine Resources Council. And um, we did a small pilot reef prism deployment back in September 2020. And so the picture on the left is kind of the day we put them out. And then June 1st, 2021, I'll have to see if I can get a more updated picture from Katie. But you can definitely see there's been a, a pretty obvious deposition of sand behind these reefs. And one of the ob objectives of this project was to kind of see if there could be a uh, basically a depositional environment that could be vegetated in later phases of the project. And then you can see downstream from this, there's a previous living shoreline project that the same group had done where they had a, real, a lot of success. And so they wanted to try some different materials. This picture on the far right is showing you how reef prisms are deployed, or at least one of the ways they can be deployed with this carry bar and two people can fairly easily transport a reef prism even though they weigh 120 pounds once filled with shell using this carry bar solution. And this is the same project just shown from a different angle because we had more time points for this. So again, September 2020, the day we put it out. And then you can kind of see over time the formation of this sand, uh, sand. And it's a little bit difficult to compare directly because I'm sure you all are aware more so than I am that there are seasonal water level changes in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, so try not to take try to take these sort of with the uh, with the understanding that water levels are slightly different in these pictures. But in order to compare more directly, you can look at these yellow arrows where there are some indicator pipes that have been installed to try to help track the accretion of shoreline. And so whether or not this has been 100% due to the reef prisms or just the reef prisms and the interaction with the seasonal water level still to be determined, but certainly there's been noticeable accretion behind the reef prisms, which was the main goal of this test. And I'm not sure if they got rained out because they were trying to do a big deployment last week when we had that major system roll through, um, but I believe there are more prisms than this initial deployment out there at the Lagoon House if you do have the chance to stop by I'm sure you can just head down the stairs back there and check it out. Okay, so that brings me to our pros. And again, that stands for Plastic Free Restoration of Oyster Shorelines, uh, a statewide project that we have to test these in multiple contexts. And the map I'm showing you gives you an idea of where we have already deployed these. So the black dots on that map are where there were already prisms in the water as of the time we formed this community of practice. And then the yellow uh, and pink are indicators of where we're basically planning to install or have already installed reef prisms as part of this statewide collaboration. 
So we started this whole effort in Cedar Key basically for one of our own living shoreline projects that we wanted a plastic free solution for and then we quickly learned that there was a huge interest from the practitioner community to learn more about these and we started re responding to requests sort of individually and piecemeal and then Mark and I said we really should just write a grant to get a big group together and train as many practitioners around the state as we can because we can see there's a huge demand for this. And even though, like I said, this is a relatively new material and the goal of this project is to test how well it performs, there are a lot of people that are, are pretty excited about the opportunity to test them. Um, and that's one really great thing about the community of practitioners in Living Shorelines is that they're very open to trying new solutions um, and they don't insist on something being 100% proven before being willing to try it. Um, so that's really great. The graphic on the right just kind of shows how the integration with the, with the Reef Prism inventors and the local site partners has been really a, a great recipe for success. And then the picture on the left is a recent deployment that just took place up in the panhandles through the Choctahatchee Basin Alliance of part of their reef prisms they're actually installing uh, we only promised to build and deploy 30 through the grant but they are installing well over 100 at this project site called liza jackson park and they also have several homeowners interested in reef prism projects so they have gone again with the reef formation of prisms with these three lines of of prisms and these little wings to help bend waves better but again they could really be stacked in any configuration as long as you're able to get a permit for that and you plan in the required gaps and, and everything like that. So as part of this project, we basically went around the state and you can see Mark there uh, describing the process of prisms and more information about this material to one of our uh, groups of local partners. And um, here's another picture from a site assessment where we kind of took detailed elevation measurements and decided where exactly the prisms would best fit with project goals. And so we have a range of different project sites. Some of them are intertidal reefs, like the last one I showed you. Um, this one on the left is in Brevard County in the city of Cocoa Beach, and that is going to be a fully subtitle system. Their goal with that project is actually just to enhance oyster recruitment and oyster populations, and it doesn't have anything to do with erosion in that case, whereas in this one on the right, it's in Sarasota County. The goals there are more related to erosion prevention. So again, every site is different, and that's really the point is to figure out where reef prisms are best suited and where they really don't work as well so we can um, you know, target them to where they're most effective. Another major part of this grant and this statewide collaboration is workshops where we train volunteers, practitioners, staff, you know, all kinds of different folks have come to these workshops um, to learn how to build prisms and produce prisms for the small pilot project, but also many times we've seen these workshops have started to produce prisms for much larger projects and even other projects outside of the scope of the grant, which is really the goal is, you know, the train the trainer model is to get people to, to go forth and, and spread the knowledge and the technique around. And we've certainly seen that. In fact, these folks in the green, they are part of the uh, Gulf Core, the Conservation Core up in the Panhandle. And they were recently awarded a national award for how much work they've done and their, their innovative practices in, re, in oyster reef restoration. And part of what they mentioned in that article was their production of these reef prisms on a pretty large scale up in the panhandle. So congratulations to the Gulf Core group. All right, so I promised you I'd give you some tips for how you can get involved with this work if you're interested. So we have an upcoming workshop to teach people how to build prisms for use in the Fort Pierce area, and that will be April 26th. There are two different shifts that you can come and, and learn and help build prisms. It'll be at the St. Lucie County Extension Office. And if you're interested in volunteering, there are a limited number of spots. So you can get in touch with Vincent and his contact information is there on the slide. And I'm sure Lisa will um, send that out with the follow-up. 
as well, just to let you all know how to get involved. But that, that'll be an exciting thing. And then eventually down the road, once the permit modification is approved, these prisms will be deployed at Old Fort Park, which is gonna be the local demonstration area for the PROS project there. Uh, but also there's other groups there, the Florida Oceanographic Society. I know they have several projects where they're planning or hoping to use prisms. And again, also at the Lagoon House in Palm Bay, if you want to see some prisms that are already in the water. If you are interested in learning more or being more involved in the community of practice, we do have a Microsoft team that's open to anybody. You just have to email me and I can add you. And this is, these are just a couple screenshots from the team. We, we post updates, we have regular meetings, and we hear you know, progress on how projects are doing. We also have a video series through YouTube where people can learn how to, you know, it's kind of a step-by-step -step guide to every piece that you need to know to build prisms. And we also have guides on monitoring, on how to co uh, construct the collapsible forms, you know, a how-to guide, like if videos aren't your thing, we also have a written guide for how to construct the prism. So we have a lot of support on that team. And it's also a great way to connect with other people that are doing living shorelines in general in your area. So definitely drop me a line if you'd like to be added to that team. And lastly, I just wanted to let you know that for living shorelines in general, Florida Sea Grant and our partners have a lot of support out there. We have resources online related to permitting. We contribute a lot to the Florida Living Shorelines website that has maps of local projects. It has contact information for contractors and consultants that can help people build their own living shoreline lists of plant species. There are lots of great resources on that website. And then also um, coming up this summer, we are going to start again offering the Living Shorelines for Marine Contractors training. That's really great for consultants, permitting folks, contractors, um, even local government staff who are interested in doing Living Shorelines work in their day to day. So uh, we've taught several of those trainings virtually and now we're ramping up for hopefully for an in-person model of those courses again starting later this summer. So that um, I'm also obliged to tell you that this work was funded in part by a grant from FDP and NOAA. And we're very thankful to them for supporting this work because as you can see, it's really gone pretty far and we've been happy with the results that we've seen. And also a project that has this many moving parts, has a lot of partners, and so I have a lot of the folks that are involved in the PROS grant um, listed. There actually are more than 90 people that are a member of the PROS team, so it's too many to list on the slide, so I only listed the people who are part of the official grant-funded pilot areas, but there are, are lots more out there, so um, it's been really great to work with this group. And I won't make you look at this slide too much longer, um, but I just wanted to stress that even though I'm the one here talking, um, it really has taken a lot of people to get to get this going. And we're really, really thankful for all of the partnerships that we have had as part of this project. Okay. So it looks like there's quite a lot of questions in the chat and I can stop sharing and take questions. Yeah, um, so let me, the first question is from Catherine and she asks the Flagler location, is that Gamble Rogers? Um, it is actually at the Marine Land uh, or at the Whitney Lab across from Marine Land. So they're around back of the auditorium there. Okay, great. And while um, for our participants, while we're going through the question and answers, I'm gonna put up an evaluation poll. Um, if you would take the 10 seconds to complete it, we really appreciate it. And again, want to thank Savannah for that excellent presentation. So the next question is, would a college student interested in living shorelines benefit from the contractor's course? We have actually had several college students take the training, and um, I guess it just depends on your interests. And, and I think it's it provides good skills, especially for people that want to get involved in coastal restoration. It could be listed if you're trying to get an internship or something. Um, so I think so. We've had good 
good reports from the handful of college students that have taken it. So um, yeah, if, if it's within your interest, I think you could benefit. And for those of you who are local, I put Vincent's email address um, in the chat. And if you wanna join that pros team page, I did put Savannah's email in the chat as well. Um, Sarah asks, what protocols do you have in place for monitoring the success of the prisms? Yeah, so we have kind of two levels of, of monitoring protocols. We have like a very basic minimal mo monitoring that involves things like putting a PVC pipe in a known location and tracking that shoreline change from a standard photo spot. Uh, we also have photo quadrats where you take up close pictures of the prisms at you know predetermined spaces along the reef to look at oyster and other you know barnacles and other animals that have recruited. Um, and then also just sort of a general assessment of overall condition, how much have they degraded and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's like the three basic, very minimal things that we track. But we also have, uh, we're very lucky, one of our uh, additional grants related to this one is funding a, a full-time biologist to look at wave attenuation using wave gauges and uh, also water quality improvements using a benthic chamber that you can actually enclose an entire prism and track nutrient changes and turbidity changes within that chamber. So that's much more involved. We also have um, in sites that aren't airspace, like military airspace, uh, of course, the Panhandle location, we can't fly our drone, but and most of the other locations, we have a drone that we can fly, and that gives a lot of really detailed information. Um, so yeah, there's sort of a range depending on what equipment you have and how committed you are, how much time you have. Uh, but we do have a guide that we give out to folks. Okay, and um, these questions were answered in the chat, but just in case people aren't monitoring them. Renee asked where the Lagoon House was. The Lagoon House is MR, uh, Marine Resource Council location. They're located in Palm Bay, Florida, up in Brevard County. And then um, we had a request to how to join the PROS team page. And again, email Savannah, and her email is savannah.barry at ufl.edu. And it's in the, the chat as well. Um, I don't see any other questions. Maybe we can stay on for a minute or two longer and see if we get any other questions coming in. Otherwise, I wanna thank you all for joining us um, for our March webinar. And of course, I wanna thank Savannah for an excellent presentation. There's a lot of thank yous and great presentation and all sorts of great comments in the chat if you wanna go through and look through them. Great, thank you all so much for your time. And I, yeah, to, yeah, thanks, Saray. Good to see you and Holly and others that joined that are that are part of the group. All right. Well, with that, I want to say thanks to everyone. Our next uh, presentation is April nineteenth. That's going to be on the economic impacts of harmful algal blooms in the Indian River Lagoon. Oh, and we have another question. Okay, so the CSA cement, how hard is it to buy? So the it, uh, if you want to buy pure CSA, it's not hard to buy. Our supplier is Whitecap Industries, and they are sometimes backordered depending on which regional office you have to go through, but you basically just reach out to them and depending how many bags you buy uh, and shipping costs and that kind of thing vary, but it's really more about just getting your order submitted and dealing with any time delays on their end. If you want to buy some like right now and work with it, there is uh, at Home Depot, you can buy the type of mix called Cement All. It's actually a pre-mix of the CSA and sand. And we've found that that off the shelf version has a, you know, we don't like the consistency of it as much as mixing your own masonry sand with the CSA. Um, so we recommend the pure CSA. You also save money if you do it that way because uh, pure masonry sand is um, cheap to buy. So you can, uh, and the CSA itself, when you buy it in bulk is cheaper per unit, but you can buy right off the shelf at Home Depot Cementol and mix it with water and use it in this application. I apologize, I missed um, a question that was asked early on. Um, William asks, um, 
He would like to get information about constructing a living shoreline to restore the horseshoe crab breeding beach on Parish Park and the Max Brewer Causeway in Titusville. Can you assist? So that's that's kind of difficult because horseshoe crabs actually may be in conflict with the living shorelines approach. They actually require sand uh, that's not vegetated or at least not densely vegetated for their nesting. So that's a little bit more complex of a situation and probably would have to involve some sort of beach nourishment or at least beach paired with, you know, vegetated strips. I'm not really familiar with that area, but there may be be somebody more local that is more aware of that situation and may be able to refer you to the right resource. Um, yeah, and that would be in Holly Abiel's region. Um, and she also does the horseshoe crab monitoring <laughs> for that yes. area as well. So yeah, <laughs> Savannah's also engaged in. So. Um, Jerry asks, if you want to install prisms in the South Fork of the St. Lucie River, which is Martin County's major um, estuary river system, which has been too polluted for oysters in the recent past, what more resilient invertebrates might recruit? Um, yeah, so that's, that's again, tough. Um, but we have seen sea squirts, barnacles, um, those types of things, uh, bryozoans even recruiting onto these uh, prisms in different locations. So it's really any sessile organism that needs a hard substrate to attach can live on the surface. If you have the larvae in the water column and it's in the right uh, depth of water and you know salinity and that kind of thing for that organism, then it can survive on them. Um, so I think, yeah, some, some sort of a uh, more, more yuck tolerant invertebrates uh, probably could do well on the surface of prisms. We've even seen examples, and this is a lot more involved in terms of permitting and logistics, but we have seen examples where people have put prisms in water that has oyster larvae and, and allowed them to recruit and then moved that prism to a, a different location to see if the oysters can survive. Um, but of course, that's, that's definitely a risk because if conditions decline and there's bad sal you know, salinity conditions or something that kills off the oysters, then you've gone through a lot of, um, a lot of hassle for not a big payoff. So um, it's all, it's all uh, dealing with the local context. John asks for um, the spec specifics for the jute that you purchase, um, so weight per yard, et cetera. We do have that information. I can't recall it off the top of my head. I know we buy um, we buy it like at a, a big roll, which I think is 400 feet per roll. And there are ideal specs in terms of the number of warp line and weft lines per, um, but I'll have to, if you join the pros team or if you send me an email, I can get you more specific information. And if you're in the area, definitely um, try to come to one of our workshops because Mark is the true expert on like the technical stuff and he can really help. All right, so we'll stay on for a few more minutes to see if any additional questions come in. But again, I want to thank you all for your time and for joining us. Okay, I will, there's been a request for um, all that information. I will send an inform, an email to the registrants, including um, the flyer for the um, upcoming Fort Pierce workshop, as well as Savannah's email so that you all um, can contact her if you need to, or have an interest in joining the, the team page. Um, and then there's a question asking if you have any projects with VIMS in Virginia. Um, so I do not currently, we did work with them to apply a model that they originally developed for determining suitability of living shoreline approaches. Uh, it's basically a GIS model. 
Uh, but I don't have any actual like on the ground living shoreline projects with them. We've presented this material at some of the national conferences and had some interest from people in that region, but nothing active at the moment with them. All right, Savannah, if you don't mind hanging on for another minute or two. Otherwise, thank you all, and we will see you on April 19th. Yeah, and John talks about all the projects in the Chesapeake Bay. What is TOGA? I don't know that acronym. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> John, you can, if you have a microphone, you can unmute yourself if you wanted to speak. <laughs> TOGA is volunteers called Tidewater Oyster Corps Association, which has close connections with them. Yeah, that's awesome. They have so many good partnerships there. I'm originally from Virginia and I always idolized people that worked at VIMS. Um, so <laughs> they're a great group. Great, thank you. All right, well, our participants are leaving us and we have no more questions. So we will officially call it for today. Thank you again, Savannah. And thank you everyone. Have a great week. Yeah, this was great. Thanks, Lisa.